Hi, Shows fans. I am super excited to introduce to you uh, Chris Cox this evening. Uh, Chris reached out to me and wanted to share his uh, experience working at Valley Shush. So, Chris, welcome. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you. Well, the first thing I'd like to do, uh, just in case this will be the first time that somebody has seen this video and hasn't seen our Facebook page, tell me how you found out about the uh, Valley Shush channel, because I think this is a really nice story. Well, I... Uh... My daughter, Jennifer, uh, got in contact with me telling me that there was a Valley Shus channel with a whole bunch of YouTube uh, videos on it. And uh, she was actually born a year after the, the resort folded. So she wasn't born when I was working at Valley Shus for, I, I'm sure I had not been there for two full years possibly a little longer. And, uh, but we had lived in Aqua Valley. So we'd driven back and forth past the resort many times. And I probably took her there hiking at some time or another. So she knew that the Valley Shush was in my history. So she found that and message saying, you should check this out. And so I did. Okay. Did, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've shared that story with a few people and, and, and the question they have asked me is, um, like, how did she find it? Did, did she say, like, was she actively trying to find something about Valley Shush or? I, I don't believe so. And I know when I'm looking at YouTube, there is, uh, there's at least a tab that brings up uh, recent recent postings. So I, I think she was probably, you know, looking at a page full of postings and one of them was was Valachus 10 or 15 or something like that. And yeah. That's that that was her her find. Yeah. I know when I um, was interested in starting this project, every time I typed in something, I came up with nothing. So uh, <laughs> it, I'm, I'm glad there's something out there now. So if anybody's curious, uh, at least they will uh, be able to see either the Valachus channel or, or uh, the Facebook page. So yeah, well, I know that after she told me about it, I went on to YouTube and I went into their search and just searched Valachus and it came up with the channel right away. So yeah, well, that's awesome. Every time I, I think about that story, it, it makes makes me smile. So um, all right. So what what years? Or let me ask you this: How did you? Um, get into or interested in the ski business and and what led you and uh, to Valley Shush and what year was that? You're freezing up. Okay. Can you can you hear me all right now? Are we, are we having some problems with it freezing up on us? Yes, we are. All right. We'll, we'll just try to work our way through it. Um, the question I had is, um, what, like, what started your interest in the ski business? And then how did you end up at uh, Valachush? Well, um, I, I, I was a skier from somewhere around when I was six. My neighbor took me out and uh, we went, got me skiing. Um, my parents, I think, had skied in the past, but eventually came out and started skiing with me. And when I was somewhere around 12, my father was involved with a group of, of people that bought a piece of property and started a ski area just south of North Bay in a town called Boston called Nipissing Ridge. And it operated for a couple of years before it was bought by another individual, Dean Harris, whose son was Mike Harris, who eventually became the, the premier of Ontario. So while he was at that area, I started working for him as a ski instructor. He had a little ski school, and I think I was 13 when I first started with what he called his junior ski school. And I went on to become a ski instructor once I was 15, which was the age where we were able to actually get certified. And I continued at the club for a number of years when uh, 
when I was 17, there was a, a magazine called Ski Canada, or yeah, Ski Canada, I think. Anyway, I found an advertisement in that that, that was advertising a hotel and restaurant ski area management course at the college in Toronto, Humber College in Toronto. And uh, I was interested in that, so I enrolled. I, we, we started the, the college in the middle of the summer. And during the summer to fall period, we visited a few different uh, mentors that, that were involved in delivering that, uh, that program. And one of them was Lloyd Edwards. We went to the ski area at Valley Shoss and he walked us up and down the hills and did a number of different things. And I eventually asked him for a job to work there during, we had a, a winter work placement that was involved with the college, sort of like a hands-on. And he hired me and I stayed there on and off for a couple of years and then uh, from 76, I believe, to 79, I worked there full time, okay. winter and summer. Um, then we were also working there uh, during your college time as well. So, yes. So yeah. What, what years were that? So, like that started 73. That was best I can remember. Okay. This is a lot of water under the bridge since yeah. 73. Um, <laughs> Did you did other mentors talk to you? Do you remember any other places that uh, you? Yeah, we went to we went to uh, Blue Mountain, which is now a, a pretty big resort. We went to uh, Hidden Valley, that was up near, uh, well, a little bit outside of, of Barrie. And we went to Mont Saint Louis and Moonstone. There was a number of different places that we went around to and they they would come to the college and give us little bits of advice and things like that like stay out of the ski business <laughs> was your uh, was your interest in always like in the the actual operation of the ski resort itself or was it more in a restaurant you know what did you have a passion for any anything in particular uh, i really started off really enjoying the mechanics of the toes and and equipment and the grooming equipment and things like that and it grew more into the the full operation i you know you pretty much did everything for a number of years i mostly made snow in the first year and then was you know underneath the the thigh call and the bombardier working at changing the bogey wheels and anything anything that needed to be done it was a group effort and everybody got involved in it so so were you pretty mechanically inclined then yes okay so all that stuff was kind of like second nature to you for it, it was Easier than some of the other things, yes. Okay. <laughs> um, well, since Lloyd Edwards, you know, made such a big impression on me being, you know, my dad's business partner there at the very beginning, what, what can you tell me about your, your experience with, with Lloyd? Uh, Lloyd was a great boss, if you will, the whole time that I was there. The, he, uh, he, he supported me a great deal through not only Valley Shus, but into... SMI, I did a, a fair amount of work with SMI, traveled around the United States with them somewhat. And uh, he, he supported that as well. And I remember Hazel telling me that uh, he was happy when I decided that I was gonna settle down and just stay at the, the ski area. So it was, uh, it was, it was a, a big influence on uh, me staying in the ski business as long as I did. Although it was him that eventually had to tell me that they were gonna let me go from the ski area too, so. What was that last part? It was him that came by to tell me that they were going to dismiss me from the ski area as well. I had worked there for, for as I said, I think three and four, or four years, full-time winter and summer. And winter was always 
very, very busy time. In the summertime, much less so, as you can imagine. And uh, in the one, the last summer that I was there, about halfway through the summer, he came by to say that they uh, had decided that they couldn't support me in a full-time role any longer. And I had just bought a house that year, and that was when I decided, okay, fine, the ski ski business may not be something that I can work through for the rest of my life. I might need to go and do something different. So that's that's what we did. Yeah. So um, when you say they at that time, it was it was a ski club, and it was it was a yeah. It was what the, it really. All the time that I worked there, they called themselves a, a semi-private ski club. We had a, a, well, we had a couple of boards of directors. There was a holding company that they had investors that had put more money into the operation or into the purchase and operation of the of the club, it was complicated. Like, although they were operating with pri private or semi-private members, uh, Lloyd still had a fair amount of investment in it. Like, the, he was not bought out of the 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 area outright when they became a semi-private. He still he still had several. Uh, well, I don't know how much would have been now because dollars are different than what they were. And I think your father may have as well. I, I, I know that when your family came to the area, you generally, I, I believe you stayed with Lloyd quite a bit once he built his house. I, I'm not sure where you stayed before that, but it, it was seen as being in part at least your ski club too so okay yeah that's one thing you know obviously being so young um i i wasn't privy or nor did i have any kind of knowledge of you know that whole transition from starting off at the ski resort and then going to the uh ski club and um you know for me i just uh, remember obviously going up there you know, for, for holidays and vacation and going skiing and, and seeing everybody. And, and uh, like you were saying, when uh, Lloyd and Hazel lived on the side of the chalet there, that's when, uh, you know, we would stay in different locations like in, a, you know, Orangeville. And then like I just posted on Facebook, my, my one sister remembers staying at the, uh, at the Hockley Motel, which I think is so cool after watching the, uh, <laughs> that sitcom <laughs> Shit Creek or whatever going, I actually stayed there. Um, and then once uh, Lloyd built the, uh, his beautiful house there on top of the hill, every time that we uh, came up, we would stay there. Now I remember coming up in the summertime uh, by myself and staying with them, you know, down, you know, in the chalet. And I think then I can't remember, I may have stayed up in that garret above the, the kitchen uh, if, if there was nobody there, I'm, I'm assuming in the summertime, I, I don't remember seeing a whole lot of uh, folks around in the uh, in the summertime when I was up there for the, the few the few memories that I have. But um, um, anyway, I, we've kind of been talking about some different topics, and I may end up uh, covering some of them again. So basically, seventy three to seventy nine was the basically the time you were there. Um, so I just kind of like to start off at the very beginning. So you're going to school, yeah, uh, full time, and then you basically once the ski season started, uh, would go out and work on weekends, or tell me how that went and what what how they kind of brought you into the fold. Yeah, so in the fall, probably starting around the middle of October, I actually started going up and preparing for the winter, spreading hay on the some of the spots that had recently been bulldozed and things getting getting the t-bars onto the onto the rope and uh, the wire rope just doing things like that on the on the weekends while i was going to school and then when ski season started would have been 
probably mid-December at that time, I actually moved up to the ski area and I was there full time through that whole winter season. Were you were you still going to school during the week or no? The, okay. the school school was paused. Everybody everybody that was in the college or in that course okay. went to different ski areas and different places. Some of them had went to ski areas that they had worked at previously or the you know for a few years. And I didn't have one to go to that was easy like that, that would operate as much as what Valley Schuss did. And uh, that's how I asked Lloyd if I could work for him and do my, uh, I guess we called it a work term. It's like an internship, basically. An internship, yeah. And uh, so that, I, mo I moved into that loft above the kitchen. Lloyd and Hazel still were still lived in the in the chalet at that time at the on the side of the chalet, mm -hmm. and uh, that winter I for the first half of winter probably worked making snow more than anything else, and then after you know snow was established it was doing the grooming and. Oh, there were a number of other things, even if weekends, if there was somebody that didn't come in to operate the tow, then it was go and operate the tow. And any other mechanical jobs that were around involved a little bit with that. Um, Marvin Bookman worked there at that time. He did a lot more of the, the vehicle maintenance than, than anybody else. You're talking about like the thigh call, the bombardier or trucks, yeah. and tractors and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, when, when you started, so I'm assuming uh, every summer or whatever, after the ski season was over, they took all the, the T bars off and all that stuff and stored them for the. the yeah, the we took all that off and, and did maintenance on it. If we could see that there was maintenance that, required we oiled all of the wire rope that the t, t bars yep. get attached to and got it ready to to basically sit through the summer without being used and uh then that year i went back to school and that's that second term was right through to the fall of the next year was there much uh, like safety checks involved every year when you're putting the lifts, you know, back in service, uh, that type of stuff? Yeah, the there there were safety checks that we did ourselves, but also there was a safety inspection that was done by lifts and elevators, Ontario lifts and elevators. So the the toes, the the ski toes, fell underneath the same regulations as building elevators hmm, interesting so they would they they would come and make an inspection and uh with t-bars it was usually you know even when we had three t-bars and the small cable toes i don't believe that they were there more than one day could have been a, a couple of days but they went there an awful lot and what they would do is come in and check that the counterbalance was was free and moving and that all of the safety stops would work on the on the, the toe so there's an emergency gate mm -hmm. at the end should somebody stay on the toe longer than they're supposed to as well as uh, on every tower there's derailment devices that, that stop the toe if it, if it derails they they would get us to run their toes, check all the, the those things function properly, and uh, they basically sign a document that was saying that they that we had passed the safety inspection that year, and it was posted someplace in the club. That, was that a requirement for every uh, ski season to have a new certification or whatever safety certification? Yes, it was. Okay. 
And was that basically? Um, I don't know if they made it there every season, but it was required. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, something else you mentioned as far as the, the straw or the hay, um, uh, was that just to facilitate if there wasn't a lot of a snow or whatever, it was easier to ski over the hay than to ski over sandy soil or whatever? Is that what the gist of that was? Or Yeah, two, two purposes. Um, it insulated the ground as well. So especially when you're first making snow or even the first snowfalls that come, if there's nothing but bare soil, that's not got any frost in it yet and it melts the snow away from the from underneath so grass that grows naturally of course serves as an insulator but if we had that well that first year particularly that i was there they had bulldozed quite a bit of a, a new run and the straw keeps the snow that falls from melting and if it does get a little bit bare, your skis slide over the straw a lot easier than they slide over frozen soil. So yeah, that's uh, that's fascinating. Never thought about, but that, I, I could certainly understand that with the soil temperature, right? If it's like you were saying, if the if the whatever the frozen precip falls right directly on the soil, that you know until the, the soil temperature gets cold enough, I can see how that would definitely affected. I, I never heard that explained like that before. So that's, uh, so that's interesting. Um, all right. So then the other thing you mentioned is snowmaking. So that's something um, I remember as a kid that just blew my mind. I was so fascinated with this contraption that, uh, that made snow. And uh, I think I may have, that probably was my first exposure to snowmaking is up up there you know in subsequent years i've seen different uh different types of snowmaking but so so how was that as far as you know you showing up um you know with your with your knowledge you know previously working at ski resorts did you did you uh have any other experience or uh, i've never I'd, I'd never made any snow before it was one of our subjects that we studied in college. So there, we, we had had some manufacturers come in, Lloyd probably one of them, or like rep representing SMI, explain how their different technologies worked and what sort of requirements they had, you know, temperature wise and things like that. So I, I had a little bit of an idea excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, that I, I had never made snow myself. The ski area that I worked at, at the Nipsing Ridge in, in Powassan, they had a number of different sort of contraptions that they had either invented themselves or borrowed pieces from here and there. And they had at one time, had one, one of the SMI um, guns, but it was not the the models that that we had at Valley Shus. It was like very early models, which was almost just like a fifteen horsepower electric motor with a fan stuck on the end of it and blowing water into the back. It was they're rather rather different than what they eventually developed them into. See, I, I find that interesting. That's one thing I'm still. Um got on my list of things to investigate because you're not the only person I've heard uh, reference SMI and this 15 horsepower snow gun because everything I look that I can find online basically starts in 1974 and it looks like it's the, the 320 uh, as far as the promotion stuff. So like, like I said, you're not the first person I've heard mention this 15 horsepower. Well, there is kind of curious how that got out. There, there was a guy in Michigan that I visited with a 320 model in order to give a demonstration. And he had bought, uh, uh, my, my impression was that SMI had taken a lot of those original models, those original snowmakers 
back and given credit to people to buy the 320s. Mm. And he had bought every, every one that he could back from them. And he made some little modifications. He cut holes into the fans, did little other things. And then he was the first person that started to elevate the, the snowmakers. He, he hung them from cables over the middle of his his uh, ski runs. They were quite small. They were only uh, yeah, maybe two feet from the end of the engine to the to the fan. So he, he had them sort of strung around. I, and I remember, I can't remember the name of the the hill, but it was covered with oak trees. And he was proud of that because the oak trees kept their leaves and they, they uh, shaded the hills so they didn't melt so much. And he had these wires strung through the, through the oak trees and these things suspended over it. And he also had mud that he said was a secret mud that he had. <laughs> and it was, he found it on his property and he would paint the, the blades of the fans with this mud. And he said, you know, while it was operating, the mud would, would flack off and serve as additional seeds so that it would make more snow. Wow, that's fascinating. <laughs> um, I think he, he might have been... That that guy might have been part of um, the three twenties. I, I don't remember the older ones having this, but the three twenties had like every second blade on the fan was shorter than the other. So the long blades were the tips were much cooler than the short blades, hmm. and. Because they're colder, the, the water that was being sprayed through the fans would freeze on the ends of the blades. They were Teflon coated, the little frozen bits, if you controlled the water properly, would eventually melt back off and flick out into the, into the water stream. And those were the seeds that formed the bigger snowflakes that came down later. Oh wow! That's if you weren't giving them enough water, I, I know you've probably seen some pictures where they had those big aluminum guards on either side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you weren't giving it enough water, the tips would freeze more ice and could throw off while it was a small bit, and they would throw off big bits of ice and it hit the hit those guards in order to protect people that were working around it. But, yeah, I can imagine it'd be pretty dangerous with chunks of I guess it was, but we took them off eventually. We we stopped using them very much just because you had to clean them all the time and it was easier just to try and control the water properly and Okay. Um but your experience starting at uh at Valley Church was the uh the 320, the SMI 320 snowstream. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> they had they had two models, and the one model was a full cast aluminum housing, and it had a bearing problem, and so they ended up recalling all of those. But I think they called them all still 320. So I, I remember taking, I, I drove from Valley Shuss, in the spring, I took all of the old models back, just the, just the engines and the extension to the head, if you will. Okay. I took them all back on a trailer and came back with the replacements. I'm, I'm surprised that SMI went through so many, uh, so many re revisions and stayed above water with what it sounded like they were always, you know, warranting their 
their original purchases, but they they became pretty good good piece of equipment eventually. Very yeah. different. Very different. Yeah, well, I think that's one of the uh, you know the fascinating things to me about that technology and, and reading about the uh, patent. You know, kind of how that started. Um, but I I can see how you know with technology changing and how, you know it, it it sounds like they were very adept to you know constantly changing and you know making it better and better, which to me is pretty impressive that they, you know, showed that they were in the, they were in for the long game and they kept trying to improve, you know, and, you know, reinvest in the, in the company. So, um, but, um, so going back to when you, when you started uh, doing, uh, making a snow, was it, did you have a, a mentor or did somebody, you know, how, how did that process go of you learning that 320 and, and figuring out the art and science of that? Obviously, like you said previously, you had a little bit of understanding from your college courses. But what was it like when you actually started doing it yourself at, uh, at Balashosh? I'm sure that Lloyd showed me a little bit of it. Mur Murray wasn't there that year. He was, he was living in British Columbia. There was probably... I'm, I'm going to say that probably at least three other people that had some snowmaking knowledge that I was working with. So we, we, would, we would be a crew of two. So there would be somebody working the days, somebody working the nights. <clears throat> I think that a couple of those people were only there on weekends, though. So if we could if we could make snow for twenty four hours when the temperature allowed it, we would do that in two crews. And although I do remember like making snow at least once for about thirty hours in a, in a row, drinking a lot of coffee. <laughs> yeah. 